ለሚቀጥለው እንግዳችን ሚስተር ፊሊፕ ኦድዋየር ናቸው እሳቸውን አስተዋውቃለሁ በቅድሚያ ፊሊፕ ሃስ ሊቭድ ኢን ኢትዮጵያ ፎር ሞር ዳን 5 ኢየርስ ኤንድ ሃስ ቢን ኢን ኤንድ አውት ኦፍ ኢትዮጵያ ፎር ቬሪንግ ሌንግስ ኦፍ ታይም ሂ ዋዝ አ ፋውንደር ሴክሬተሪ ኦፍ ዘ ዩሮፒያን ዩኒየን ቢዝነስ ፎረም ኢን ኢትዮጵያ ኤንድ ዋዝ አክቲንግ ቲም ሊደር ኦን አ ቢዝነስ ክላይሜት ፕሮጀክት ኤንድ ክሬትድ አ ጎቨርመንት ኤንድ ፕራይቬት ሴክተር ኮላቦሬቲቭ ኔትወርክ ኦን ኢንተርናሽናል ዲጂታል ትሬድ ፋሲሊቴሽን ፊሊፕ ኢዝ አን አክቲቭ ሜምበር ኦፍ ፊኒጌል አ ሜምበር ኦፍ ካረንት ጎቨርመንት ኮሊሽን and a national committee member of the Finnegal Intercultural Network which address migrant issues. Philip, the stage is yours. Welcome. And did not chew. Yeah, I, hope I, I hope I got that right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ikerta, Ikerta. Um, okay, well, look, uh, I think I'm responsible for talking about politics um, and, and the GERD and just kind of wrapping a few things around the problems that Ethiopia is having internationally. So let me start by pointing out that on Wednesday, the 5th of May, I'll slow down as well. Uh, on Wednesday, the 5th of May, you will be celebrating Patriots Day in Ethiopia. And Patriots Day goes back to the 1930s when the rebels uh, tried to um, kick out the Italians out of Ethiopia. Um, Haile Selassie went to the UK uh, to uh, exile and he funded the rebels up until uh, he came back in 1941, in May 1941, with the help of the British and the rebels. But what people probably don't realize is that in that movement of something like 25,000 resistance fighters, uh, women fought on the front line as well. And we know that the position of women in Ethiopia at that time would have been very much a second class citizen and not recognized as equal to men. So it's extraordinary that uh, they were fighting on the front line alongside their men. Uh, they also provided spies and women make great spies. They make better spies than men. Um, and uh, of course, they nursed uh, the sick and the injured uh, during that period. Ironically, the British who uh, helped Ethiopia to regain or to kick out the Italians, the British and most of their erstwhile World War II old colleagues are not very supportive of the Abbey government right now. COVID, however, is putting a new item on the global agenda, namely unity of purpose. The argument that no one is safe until all are safe, is now very much part of the narrative around COVID at an international, if you like, geopolitical level. And of course, this must mean that that concept will trickle down from, COVID, from being a COVID concept into a new form of international relations where uh, countries that at the moment are not regarded as part of the first world. And I say that I'm not pointing the finger at Ethiopia, I'm pointing the finger at the West, um, will be uh, become more part of the West. More about that later. Of course, I can't go on to my subject either without talking about today, the 3rd of May 2021, because today is World Press Freedom Day. And as we all know, we have suffered at the hands of the press in relation to the problems in Ethiopia and the perception of the Abbey government. It's Press Freedom Day. The emphasis every year is on and seems to solely rest on the difficulties experienced by journalists at the front line, especially in unstable environments, conflict zones, and where repressive regimes are limiting the ability of the press to report openly. That side of the World Press Freedom Day, I commend to you and for your sympathetic consideration, because there is no doubt that in many cases, international news that is distributed is hard earned by the journalists that produce it. However, 
On this day, I wish to call out the less than acceptable standards adopted by some of those press from the lowest in the chain right up to the world leaders of the press, organizations that listen to the wires and buy any or all stories available on a given subject. The good ones, of course, do the fact checks and they sub edit the stories properly for their own audience pools. However, there are many lazy mainstream media outlets, and we know some of them because of the way they've treated Ethiopia, whom do not check the story assertions properly. And the result is that an unscrupulous and so-called journalist or correspondent can slip bias into a story and get it all the way through the media. To succeed with disinformation, the experts will tell you that all your lies have to be big. They have to be sensational and they have to reach and grab the attention of your intended audience. That means that disinformation must be recycled many times and at different layers in the media and through different channels in order to make maximum impact. So for example, on Saturday, I checked a story uh, about Tigray uh, that was pretty much against Abby. And I put it through uh, the Google search engine and I found it over 10 times in different parts of the media globally, from a very low flying media in Africa, right up to the top. And that same story and that same headline was repeated many, many times over. So you can imagine an American politician or a European politician uh, re seeing this story in their local press, which has been generated by someone who doesn't care about the truth and who is only trying to sensationalize their own position. That leader is influenced by what they're reading in the newspaper. Even if they say they're not, they can't avoid it. By the time your average American and European is reading their daily newspaper or listening to the radio news over a cup of coffee, these stories have been recycled so many times that they are now cross-referencing each other across the globe, such that the reader or listener now believes that World War III has started in Ethiopia and their, government, uh, and their governments must do something about it now. Sadly, when this happens, opinion is no longer rational. I don't want, however, to give the impression that the government of Ethiopia is on its own. It's not. There are always back channels between the protagonists, um, although I've heard that there's none between the TPLF and the government. There has to be a means for them to communicate. In this case, all the countries of the world, or most of the countries of the world, have an embassy in Ethiopia with uh, quiet diplomacy continuing. This kind of diplomacy is also used to have substantive talks and create a space for understanding and, uh, the problem and making important decisions. And I'm not sure if um, uh, Dr. Atikilt at the beginning uh, gave you an update on the Irish situation in relation to a message from the Department of Foreign Affairs last week. Uh, did he? Yes, we yes. received a letter. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, okay, perfect. So I, I don't have to break that down. Good. Uh, so you can see that the kind of diplomacy that's going on in the background and the quiet diplomacy, despite the best efforts of the press uh, to say otherwise, is working. The Irish are moving, but it is taking time. Um, there was a recent, I think Rahel uh, was at this webinar, uh, as well as myself, and maybe more of you. Uh, there was a webinar in the US on the 17th of April, and I just want to quote Professor Anne Fitzgerald, because I think her advice to Ethiopia was extremely valuable. Um, and it, it chimes in with the daily briefing that we get from COVID-19 here in Ireland. I would urge the Ethiopian government to invest in strategic communications. A spokesperson in Tigray supported by humanitarian security and economic advisors, a spokesperson who can provide regular updates on these issues and a spokesperson who appears at the same time daily or weekly. 
the reason I mention that is that if you one of the things that we can rely on here in Ireland is that at six o'clock every single day of the week, we get a report from the Department of Health about the current situation with COVID-19. And it's reliable and it helps us to keep track. And of course, it helps our mental health as well to know when things are improving and also when things are disimproving, how to change our activity. That kind of a regular update from an official of the Ethiopian government would be very useful from the point of view of setting some form of a reliable contact, international contact with the world, with only the government's news coming out. It would be very useful. Okay, geopolitics. Well, I did have um, uh, uh, Simon Coveney's letter to uh, Dr. Atikilt at the start of that, um, and I was going to break it down in pieces. But let me just summarize by saying that um, in recent times, Ireland and the EU have provided or announced a total of 59 million euro in response to the current crisis in, your, in, in Ethiopia. The reason I'm highlighting that is that if you look at where this started with Ireland, um, particularly as we were approaching the 1st of January when we took on the uh, European Security Council seat, um, there was no help coming from Ireland, none that we know of. In fact, the, Ireland wasn't talking in those terms at all. So, um, and that may well be different in terms of what back channeling was going on between the two. Uh, but overtly, we understood Ireland to be uh, giving the Abbey government a very hard time. I was talking to a colleague of mine who has a big business in Ethiopia this morning, only this morning. And he reminded me that um, he said, Philip, you and I know Ethiopia very well. We know what's going on in the background. We know what the TPLF have been like for as long as we've been there. And the crazy thing about this is that the international community, who also have that knowledge, but it's systemic knowledge to them, whereas it's personal knowledge to us, um, do not seem to be reacting in the way that we would have expected. And so both of us are quite embarrassed about the way the Irish government has handled this, but relieved to see a move in the correct direction. I say that because what, we're what I'm talking about now is geopolitics. So it's not enough for me as an individual and my colleagues to contact uh, Simon Coveney and say, you've got this wrong, because we don't know the kind of things that he has to deal with on an international basis. There's international relations between Ireland and Ethiopia. There's international relations between Ireland and Europe. Ireland and the US, Ireland and the UN, um, all of them with different interests. Sometimes there can be conflicting interests depending on the subject. But where Ethiopia is concerned, all seem to be putting down as a primary concern humanitarian aid. And to see them shifting towards that and away from the language that had been used before is a positive shift. But again, I have to underline it by saying that all of this takes time because it is all about communications between parties and getting decisions made, getting agreement, um, traveling. For example, two weeks ago, uh, uh, Simon Coveney traveled to London to meet his counterpart in London. Ethiopia was on his agenda. Last week, he made a very positive statement towards Ethiopia. It's not enough. Um, but it's getting there. The, week be, the, the day after he came back from London, there was a UN Security Council statement from Ireland about the situation in Ethiopia. Again, showing a positive shift. But all the time, you can, uh, if you read these closely, you can see that behind the lines, there is still a lot of negotiating going on. So, for example, and Rahel, please... Uh, come in and if, if there's anything I uh, said to you last Friday that you want me to bring into this, uh, please do remind me. Um, but there are 15 members of the Security Council. 
five of them are permanent members. They will always be there. China, France, the US, um, the UK, and I've forgotten who the other one is, and Russia. And then there are 10 rotating seats and a number of countries rotate every two years um, in and out of the, uh, the Security Council. So you can imagine that within those 15 countries, the top five, the permanent five, they're called P5, um, always have an interest in every single item that comes into the Security Council. But an awful lot of the 10 may have no interest whatsoever. And they're either going to sit back and just go with the flow, or they're going to actively negotiate something, negotiate something else for themselves, which is completely unrelated to Ethiopia. But in order to give their support to one side or another in an Ethiopian vote, they will look for something for themselves, for their own country. So what I'm telling you here is that the global village is very lopsided in that there is one major absence, and that is Africa. Africa is not properly represented. It doesn't have voting or veto powers on either the G7, uh, starting, sorry, start with the um, uh, UN Security Council, uh, the G7 and the G20. It doesn't even have visit observer rights at, at the G7. Uh, at the G20, the African Union has permanent guest status, which means that it can sit, simply sit there and observe. It can't negotiate, it can't, even when Africa is the subject, it cannot negotiate. Um, Denmark did a report in 2011 um, there, and, and said that there is an argument for, may, for creating a seat for Africa, for the African Union at least. Uh, am I running out of time? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Rahel. Um, let me just, okay. Uh, let me jump on to the GERD. I think I've said enough about inter international relations. You understand the complexity. Um, everybody is trying to look after their own interests. And even if they don't have an interest in Ethiopia, they will use their vote in the Ethiopian situation to get something for their own country. But moving on to the GERD. We have time, Philip, it's okay. Sorry. Okay, okay, thank you, Rael. Um, the conflict in Ethiopia is further complicated by what's happening around the GERD. So you have um, the interests of Egypt, of course, um, I think we all know that uh, there is a considerable amount of the difficulty inside Ethiopia that is being aided and abetted in one way or another uh, by Egypt and their allies. Um, and if I can bring you back, I don't know if Mesfin uh, talked about the history that the 1959 agreement um, on the GERD, on, on the, the Nile, uh, where the British brokered um, brokered an agreement between Sudan and Egypt, which effectively excluded all the riparian countries and basically took ownership of the Nile for themselves and the use of the Nile, and they excluded Ethiopia. And apparently, um, when, uh, when the Derg left, the Ethiopian government contacted Egypt to open discussions about the use of the Nile and Egypt ignored them. Now, this was a deal that was brokered during uh, the colonial times. So the British uh, were, had a huge interest in this and the relationship between the British, the Sudanese and Egypt was further secured by an agreement like this, but it excluded Ethiopia. Um, the, and, and only today on, on, on the internet, I found a news article that came out today about Sudan, who are now saying they've announced that they can back out of a territorial agreement, which they had, which they signed with Ethiopia back in 1902, a hundred and, what is it, 119 years ago. 
um, that would shift the territory that they agreed Ethiopia could have. If, if, they, if they back out of this, that territory will come back into Sudan's hands and the dam would be inside the new Sudanese territory. Now, I mean, obviously it's a threat. You can't back out of a, a, an agreement that's 119 years old, but it shows you that the extent that they're willing to go to because the stakes are so high. And what that does is it disturbs the, the thinking that the international community have about resolving the problem because another layer of detail has been added into this. And if you take the 1902 agreement and the rescinding of that and the um, 1959 agreement on the Nile, it makes life very difficult. And it forces Ethiopia to get into all sorts of discussions with their international friends, of which Ireland should be one, um, to try and explain to them the problem that they're having and the way that they've been excluded and how wrong it is. And we've all moved on from the colonial period. And why is this still prevailing? So um, I think, yes, and I, just one last point on the GERD. Um, I, did a, I was doing a lot of research uh, a few weeks back about um, the extent to which the TPLF have hired um, consultants in Washington to try and influence the politicians, both in the UN and in uh, Capitol Hill. And I came across a document, uh, I came across um, Egypt hiring a consultant in February, 5th of February to be precise, and they submitted a document to uh, the Justice Department, which would then be followed through politically, um, but they're obliged by law because it's a foreign document, they're obliged to put it into the system so that there is transparency and openness. Um, and in that document, they talked about how many farms and how many people would be unemployed and farms that would lose because there was no longer irrigation from the Nile and so on. And they quoted a report called the Del Deltares report, which um, I decided I needed to check and see what this report was all about. So I did a search. The Deltares company, uh, a consultancy firm in Holland, had on their website how they withdrew from this report ever before it even started, and they withdrew on the basis that they did not think it would be independent enough. And yet here we are, and they did so in September 2015. And yet here we are in February 2021, and Egypt are quoting a non-existent consultancy report. Seriously, this is crazy. Politicians in America, on Capitol Hill, in the UN, will read a document like that, and 9.9 .9 out of 10 will not go and check and see does that report exist. And so they then accept the number of unemployed and the number of farms that are going to be lost because of whatever um, Egypt are saying. And that, that goes into the system. Now, this was, this was first, uh, the Deltares thing happened and the withdrawal all happened in 2015. So in 2015, you had the Obama administration. So let's say that Egypt started to use this straight away from 2015. Then the Obama administration had this. Then in comes Trump. The Trump administration are fed the same bit of information. They have it and it's into their embedded in their system. And now again, after Biden came in, it's gone into the Biden system. So can you imagine what kind of a battle you have on your hands when Egypt is willing to go to that extent?
I think it's outrageous. And I, I think these things need to be called out. Now, don't worry. I sent it to the Ethiopian bastard. I sent it to the Irish government. <laughs> um, and, and I presume that the Ethiopian ambassador has sent it on to uh, back home to head office in foreign affairs. And I think it's quite serious. It sounds like it's not. If you just look at it, you say to yourself, that's just a detail. But it's not just a detail. There are people that are basing their arguments on figures that do not exist. And there are people believing Egypt who are pleading, saying this in the first place, when they have no right to say it. And in fact, they're being duplicious. And it needs to be understood that they are uh, being duplicious. So that Egypt is then questioned a lot more about its position on matters of the guard. Um, I, I don't think I've left anything out, Rahel. Can you remember? What do you think? I think that summarizes it all. That's yeah? all we discussed. Yes, Gilly. Okay, okay. Anything well, look, you like to add? I, I, I'm, I'm here for questions, so please uh, okay. just, yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you finished? Yes, I think so. Okay. Thank you so much, Philip. You're welcome. That was great, as always. Okay. <laughs> Philip has been always uh, a great support to for Voice of Ethiopia in Ireland. And thank you for your continuous support. You're welcome. And uh, like you said, I agree with you on uh, invest in a spokesperson who can update us regularly from an official in the Ethiopian government. We, yeah. In fact, we requested that a few weeks ago when we first had our first meeting with Defend Ethiopia Europe, yeah. that was uh, the question we raised. And it was actually on the main news in Ethiopia that we requested 24 hour uh, you know, uh, cover so that we can get report and be updated regularly. Yeah. So that's very important. Yes, it is. Sorry, Rahel, let me just add in one more small point. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. So uh, um, it's it's not just that Ireland have made these two statements, um, one through the UN and the other in the reply to Dr. Atticult. It's also uh, that they have decided to change their approach to Ethiopia. Um, and, and this is coming out of the fact that they have made a mistake. Um, and so what they have said to the Irish ambassador to Ethiopia and the Ethiopian ambassador to Ireland is that we want to develop economic ties with Ethiopia in the form of trade, investment, knowledge and technology transfer. Well, one of my backgrounds was, in fact, this is how I first came to Ethiopia in 2006, was with a, a business charity called Connect Ethiopia which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. But I am now working on a, a more advanced version of that. I'm designing a more advanced version of Connect Ethiopia. It won't be called Connect Ethiopia, obviously for legal reasons, but, um, and I will be looking to the Ethiopian community in Ireland to become involved uh, in it with a view to, this was one of the mistakes that Connect Ethiopia made. Uh, I won't bore you with stuff here, but suffice to say, I will be back to you with something tangible to talk about um, in ter on equal terms in how we can deal with Ethiopia from Ireland commercially.